10 to 12, 13 minutes talking about being great in Manchester. Uh, some of you will have heard some of this stuff before, but I want to focus particularly on social value and legacy. So what I'm going to do very quickly is just give you an overview of what this community project was, who funded it, where we were digging, and then I want to focus on some of the feedback and some of the ways we engage with the local communities, and that's particularly relevant to today's theme, because we were talking about social value, we were talking about place making, we were talking about bringing people together as groups. And I'm going to finish off with some of the legacy of the project, which is still very much active today. So, big five year project, very unusually for the 2010s, this was a local authority funded project, for, which was particularly um, exciting for us in the Greater Manchester area. With Bearing in mind the background of austerity, local authority cuts. It was basically University of Salford, but it's a project that builds on methodology that I and my team have been working on for at least 15 years, going back to the late 1990s, working with local groups, talking to local groups, finding out what local groups want to do in terms of exploring their own past and exploring their own heritage. So it builds on things like I did Moston, did Manchester, the Tankside Archaeological Survey, and various other projects which, you're from, if you're from North West England, you might recognise. If you don't, you won't. But the point is that it's not coming out of the air. And it's not a project that uh, is imposed from above. It's a sort of negotiated project with a variety of different stakeholders or groups. Two big aims which I think are probably relevant to what we're talking about today. One is provide local communities with access to their own heritage through a variety of training and site-based activities on land owned by local authorities, which deals with issues around access and safety, but also to raise awareness about class at local community level, ex uh, promoting exploration of local communities by local individuals and also giving them additional skills to interpret their own past. So training workshops and encouraging people to go out and explore themselves was a vital and central part of this project. And we felt that was very important in terms of establishing ownership and understanding and also providing a legacy to the project. So it's all very nice and well for professional archaeologists to come along, do something fantastic, and then just walk away and the local community feels high, left high and dry, that they've had expectations raised, and those expectations are left to win. So this was always seen as the next generation project, which would lead on to further themes, which is why I want to talk about uh, legacy in the, the last bit of my talk. Uh, we had a five-year outline, that outline had to uh, be uh, negotiated with our funders, in this case the 10 local authorities, Great Manchester, plus the local authority of Blackburn and Darwin, which really defined the scope of the project for us, which was a community excavation in each of those 11 local authorities, with two flagship sites that we would choose on the basis of the quality of the archaeology and the response of the local community to that archaeology. And we would do traditional things such as open days, open weekends, going into schools, but also we would use social media, and social media was a very crucial part of this project, as a way of promoting it. Bearing in mind we were designing this 10 years ago, the first YouTube video wasn't uploaded to the internet until 2005-2006, so to say this is in the early days of social media. Um, so we did cover quite a lot of ground, as you can see from, well, not seeing back from that, from that map, all the ten local authorities of Greater Manchester, plus Blackburn and Darwin in Lancashire. And we were also working with a variety of uh, groups, from young offenders to, to uh, the differently abled 
groups, to youth charities, to try and broaden the interaction and try and broaden the audience for archaeology and heritage within the city region. We also have dedicated community archaeologists. I should say there are only three full-time archaeology staff on this five year project. Uh, one of those dedicated community archaeologists whose job was to identify schools within each local authority who could take part in the two-week tra uh, training day who would let that educated archaeologist go into the schools, talk to these are primary schools, talk to school children and their teachers, develop education packs before going on site, go out on site, and then follow that up in the classroom, which meant that we had a large number of schools who were experiencing archaeology. But because we were going around each of the 11 local authorities, what we were trying to do is make sure that no individual authority only had activities in year one or in year five. So we were sort of trying to spread those activities across the life of the project so that there would be some engagement with the project throughout the city region uh, during those five years. A whole, a consequence, a whole host of facts and figures and outcomes. It's a very typical way of trying to sort of quantify your community archaeology and say, uh, engagement with <coughs> local authorities, engage open day visitors, two and a half thousand, school children, three and a half thousand, uh, adult volunteers, 1,500. You know the kind of thing. However, underlying all that, we had three research strategies, and I just want to focus on one of those research strategies, which was looking at the significance of community archaeology and social value and capital. We wanted to look at Public response to heritage education. We wanted to look at the impact of the project on people's perceptions of heritage and their own health and well being, if you like. And we also wanted to think in terms of social contribution. So that's one of the reasons why we were engaging a wide variety of groups, from primary schools to differently able groups, um, across the project. Uh, it's why we captured people's uh, personal interaction with the project. Uh, there are some quotes there which you can't read at that because they're, uh, they're too small, but we, these are verbatim quotes and interviews we had with volunteers. Uh, we specifically <coughs> dealt with uh, a number of groups with disadvantaged backgrounds, integrating them into the project, particularly in the first three years of projects, following that up with interviews with their own carers and with the uh, different area groups that participate in the project. And we put all that together and we have people, what I call people's outputs, uh, the number of people we're engaging with, uh, both within the 11 evaluations and the number of people we're engaging with on the flagship sites. So and these are quite significant numbers. There was a moment in about 2013-2014 when this was probably the largest single community archaeology project just for a moment in certainly in an, an English context in terms of the number of people who are engaging and the cross-section of engagement. Thinking about social value, we built into the project from the very beginning three different strands of feedback. It was the individual uh, taking quotes, what do you think about the project kind of feedback. And then there were two more structured ways of feedback. One of which was we devised our own uh, feedback form, which is probably a little bit too detailed. Uh, so it had about 40 different uh, questions on it. We had about a 16, 17 percent uh, feedback on this in terms of people filling it in. Uh, and what it demonstrates is some hard facts and figures about the impact of the project. It demonstrates very nicely the gender split was roughly 50-50. It demonstrates that we were not getting, there's a surprise, not getting at the age group 26 to 40 year olds they were difficult to get. Um, it also demonstrated that actually 99% of our volunteers were white, British, and Greater Manchester has an ethnic 
mix that has 11 to 12 percent uh, ethnic minorities. So that was a real problem amongst the getting to as wide a range as possible of adults. Children was different because we could go directly to primary schools in the areas of the, of the, of the Ds and we would automatically pick up the ethnic mix in those areas. But in terms of adult volunteers having a wide diversity, that was, that was a real issue. Um, we can debate why that is. None of that should be a surprise to anybody in this room. However, this is part of facts and figures that the project acquired and which we will disseminate. So this is not, this is not here today, this is based upon uh, absolute uh, feedback. We also involved an educator, um, a psychologist who looked specifically at 30 individuals from five of the digs from a variety of social backgrounds and they are with, a, with a range of questions and discovered that um, there was a real benefit to taking part of the project that cut across class, uh, class backgrounds, social backgrounds, wealth backgrounds, all around about creating communities on the site, new communities on the site. So where does that leave us with a legacy? The project finished in 20, <coughs> 2016, early 2017. There are a variety of legacies, one of which is our own local archaeology festival, which is into its third year this year, uh, in June. Uh, and that also engenders new archaeological groups as well. We had several groups set up during the project who continue uh, to exist. Social media, we created a social media presence, which is still out there, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on blogs. And in fact, our Facebook is still very active. There's a very active Facebook group still using the uh, Archaeology of Salford web pages, where you can see discussions and debates and, and help coming forward. We use our Depression uh, Manchester blog site to promote uh, a variety of community of, uh, of, uh, opportunities, and Twitter as well. We're still active on Twitter. These are long-lasting legacies from the project, which individuals and groups in Greater Manchester continue to use. And somebody flashed one of these uh, Great Manchester has revealed one that was earlier on. This is one of the consequences of that project. Working with developers who fund community archaeology using models that we've developed on Deep Great Manchester in terms of engagement. And that's just one example of the outputs. And there's so much to talk about on the project that what I would urge you to do is to go and download for free. This PDF book, which is on the deepgreatermanchester.wordpress.com uh, deep site, blogging site, download it for free, PDF, which summarizes not just the Deep Greater Manchester project, but uh, 20 or more case studies uh, from the, really from the northwest and north, uh, yeah, northwest, the Scottish examples of community archaeology that we looked at during the life of the project. So what I would say, a summary, is the legacy has to be real. The legacy is real, and don't say I have to know more time. Legacy is real and continuing, and we need a continuing legacy. Right.